In this video, we'll go over a full discounted cash flow model on Excel using five steps. So firstly, we're going to forecast the company's future cash flows. Secondly, we'll calculate the WAC, which is the discount rate we'll use to bring back the future cash flows to the present. Thirdly, we'll calculate the terminal value, which is the value of the company after the forecasted period. Fourth, we're going to discount both the cash flows as well as the terminal value back to the present value. And lastly, we'll calculate a valuation, an implied share price, and a sensitivity table. And don't worry if you didn't understand some of these steps, we'll go over them in detail in the video. Let's go. First up, we need to project the cash flows into the future. And for this, you can download the Excel file we'll be working with in the description. So over here, we've got towards the end, a tab for the income statement of the company, the balance sheet, and the cash flow statement. And we'll start our analysis at the very first tab, which is gonna be the free cash flow one. And over here, when we refer to the future cash flows, they're actually gonna be free cash flows. So to, to get those, we're gonna have to find all of these figures over here for the estimated years and eventually reach the free cash flow. And at this point, you're probably wondering, what does free cash flow mean? And in short, it's a cash flow that's available to debt and equity holders after a company pays for everything it needs to continue operating. So things like its operating expenses, capital expenditures, etc. So let's take a look at the Excel file and starting off with the revenue, revenue line up top. For this one, it's gonna be equals to the previous year's revenue, so this figure over here. Multiply that by, in brackets, one plus the growth rate that we have projected for this estimated year, which if you go down under the assumptions, it's gonna be this figure right up here. Close those brackets, hit enter, and from here, if you wanna drag it across, you just gotta select it with shift and right arrow, and then press control R, that's gonna drag it across for you. You're probably wondering where we got these assumptions from. These are basically simplified estimates that we made based on previous figures. If you wanted to make the revenue projections more sophisticated, you would basically model out each line item. So for example, if a car company has three different car models, you would model out each of the cars and try to see uh, what kind of quantity you're expecting to sell at what price in the future, and eventually find the sum of those to get to the revenue. If you look at the other assumptions down below for the COGS as a percentage of revenue, it's simply the average of that. Press the F2 key there to take a look at it. And we just projected that average out into the future. And same thing with SGNA down below. So let's look into those. For the COGS, it's simply gonna be equals to the revenue multiplied by control down arrow all the way to the bottom here, the percentage here. And we're gonna drag that across as well. So shift right arrow and control R. And for the gross profit, it's just gonna be one minus the other. So we'll go equals this figure minus this one, hit enter, and again, we're just gonna drag that across. Same thing goes for SGNA down below. So it's gonna be revenue times control down arrow, this figure over here, and then we're just gonna drag that across, control R, and then for total operating expenses, well, we only really have this one, so it's gonna be equals to this figure. And again, we'll drag that, control R, and then for the EBITDA, it's gonna be equals to the gross profit minus the total operating expenses, hit enter there, and we'll drag that across as well. Now that takes us all the way to EBITDA. Now to calculate depreciation and amortization, we're actually gonna do that in a different tab called the fixed assets. So go to control page down for that. Using this table, we're gonna be able to calculate both the DNA as well as the capital expenditures, which we'll need later as well. And down over here, we've got the different set of assumptions, which basically are like things like the average based on the previous years, and over here, we just left at a conservative 15%. This one seemed a bit of an outlier at 25%. So let's go ahead and go about that. For beginning PPE, it's just gonna be equals to the ending PPE of the previous year. Then for DNA, we'll go to equals, and it says DNA as a percentage of beginning PPE. So it's gonna be this figure over here, and we're gonna multiply that by beginning PPE. &E. Hit enter there. And for CapEx, it's gonna be the same concept. So it's gonna be this figure over here, and we're gonna multiply that by the beginning PPE. &E. From there, we're just gonna go to equals. It's gonna be beginning PPE &E minus depreciation and amortization because that dilutes the value, plus CAPEX because that's actually increasing the value of PPE, and then that's gonna be it, hit enter there. And now to drag this across, let's just go to the very top one, control shift down, shift right arrow, and press control R. Great, now we can go back to the uh, free cash flow tab by going to control, control page up. And over here, we can start filling in depreciation and amortization. This one's gonna be for 2022, so we'll go equals, control page down, and it's gonna be this figure right over here, hit enter. Then we'll just drag that, shift right arrow, and control R. 
then this is just one minus the other, this one minus this one, hit enter there, and then control R. And for operating, operating taxes, if you scroll down all the way to the bottom, you'll see over here that we have tax as a percentage of EBIT. So that's the figure we'll be using. This 21% is typically the corporate tax rate in the US, so we'll use that equals EBIT multiplied by the tax rate. So it's gonna be this figure here, and then again, control R. And down over here, it's just gonna be equals to one minus the other, hit enter there. That takes us to notepad, control R again. Then for the depreciation and amortization, here we need to add it back. But before we get into that, let me show you the whole formula for the free cash flow. It's going to be EBIT minus taxes plus depreciation and amortization. That's because they're non-cash expenses. The reason it's added back is because there's no real cash outflow, so the cash isn't actually leaving the company. Instead, this is actually an accounting term, which essentially says that you should allocate the cost of the asset over its useful life. So if it's a 10 year life, it would be allocated throughout the, those 10 years. But that doesn't necessarily mean that the cash is actually coming in or out because that already happened at the time of the transaction. So that's why you actually end up adding it back. Then you subtract capital expenditures or CapEx. And this is obviously a cash outflow because it's something like buying a new factory. And lastly, an increase in non-cash working capital is subtracted, while a decrease in non-cash working capital would be added. In short, non-cash working capital is the capital that the company uses in its day-to-day -day operations. And the formula for this is current assets minus cash minus current liabilities. So if non-cash working capital is increasing, that means that the company's assets are going up. But for that, that means that it's actually spending cash, so the company's cash flow is decreasing, hence the negative sign in front. Now that we have an idea of the formula, let's go about filling in the different line items. So for depreciation and amortization, it's just gonna be equals to control page down under fixed assets. It's gonna be this figure right over here, hit enter there, and then control R. For CapEx, it's gonna be equals to control page down, and we're gonna select the CapEx right over here, select this one, and again, control R. Now for a change in networking capital, we're gonna have to calculate the networking capital first, so the current assets and the current liabilities. To do so, we'll go to the networking capital tab, so control page down, control page down again, and this is where we're gonna be working on this. So in this tab, to save time, we went ahead and put all of the different line items. So we've got all of these that, gonna, that are gonna reach current assets, and down below we have all of the ones that are gonna reach current liabilities. If you go lower down, these are all of the different assumptions that we'll need to make in order to then be able to project all of this into the future more accurately. So first off, starting off with the daily sales outstanding. To briefly define the day sales outstanding, it's the number of days it takes a company to collect payment on a sale. So let's go ahead and calculate that. It's gonna be equals to the accounts receivable. It's gonna be this figure over here, divided by the revenue, which is gonna be right up over here. And then we're gonna multiply that by 360. Hit enter there. That's gonna give us 4.2. This is num in number of days. So it takes them 4.2 days to collect payment on a sale. If you just copy and paste that down, press F2 there to see if that's working all right. We have the days inventory outstanding. And this basically says for how many days does our inventory stay in the warehouse before it gets sold? Obviously, the sooner it goes out and gets sold, the better for us as it costs money to leave things in a warehouse. Now, depending on the industry, this number is gonna vary quite a lot. For example, if you sell something like luxury cars, then they probably stay in your warehouse for quite a long time, as opposed to something perishable like what might be groceries. Same thing down over here for days payable outstanding. It's gonna be equals to accounts payable, divided by the COGS, and then multiply by 360. Hit enter there, and that's gonna be around 32 days. So this basically says that it takes us as a company 32 days to go ahead and pay for our bills. Obviously, the longer time span, the better here. And we can go ahead and drag these out. So we'll select all three of them, shift right arrow, shift down arrow, sorry, and then shift right arrow all the way till 2021 and press control R. Now you can see that these figures are actually staying fairly consistent. So for the future estimates, we're just gonna take the average. So we'll go average, select all of these over here, hit enter there and same thing for the ones below. So press shift down arrow and then control D. That's gonna do it for us. And then we're just gonna link them like so and that should be good. Nice. Now that we've calculated these three ratios, let's go ahead and forecast all of the figures up over here. So firstly, for our accounts receivables, we already calculated the deal sales outstanding, so that's what we'll use to project it out into the future. 
So we'll go equals, then it's gonna be the day sales outstanding times the revenue figure, which is gonna be this one up over here. And then we're gonna have to divide that by 360. The reason for that is because here it's a number of days and we wanna convert that back to regular numbers. Hit enter there. Then the next one is gonna be the inventory, which is gonna be the merchandise inventory right over here. So it's gonna be the same concept here. We'll just copy, control C, control V, press the F2 key to make sure everything is making sense. And that is indeed the case, nice. Then we'll just select these two, shift right arrow and press control R to drag them across. And the last one here is accounts payable, which is gonna be the um, days payable outstanding right over here. Multiply that by the cogs, which is gonna be right over here. Then again, we're gonna have to divide by 360, hit enter there, and we'll just drag that across, shift that right arrow, control R. Great, now we need to work on all these other line items, so other current assets, as well as these ones down over here. Now to do so, we can go all the way to the very bottom here, and this is where, where we'll make a few different assumptions. So as you can see, these are all actually a percentage of revenue. So that means that if we do it for one, we should be able to just drag it across if we lock the relevant cells. So we'll go equals, then firstly we've got other current assets, which is gonna be this figure right over here. And we're gonna divide that by the revenue. For the revenue, you're gonna wanna press the F2 key, not once, but twice, the F4 key, sorry, not once, but twice. And now you want it, the dollar sign only on the 18. That means that when you copy this across, it's gonna remain on this row but it's still gonna be able to move sideways. Same thing goes for the accrued salaries as a percentage of revenue. So that's gonna be accrued salaries, so it's gonna be this one over here. So we'll go equals. Then we're gonna select the accrued salaries, divide that by the revenue, and again, we'll press the F4 key twice. Hit enter there. Now you can see that all the other ones are gonna be in order here. So we can just drag them down and just press Control D. Great, and now all of these ones we can just drag across all the way till the last actual year, and then press Control R. Nice, and then for all of these, because they don't really have big discrepancies, we'll just go ahead and take the averages. Hit the average, select these four, hit enter, then we're just gonna drag that down as well, press the Control D. Great, and then for all these ones, we'll just link them, Control C there, and then just drag across, Control V. Nice, now we have all of these other estimates as well. Now that we have all of the relevant assumptions, we can start plugging them up over here. So first off, for other current assets, we'll go equals, and this is going to be the other current assets right here. Multiply that by the revenue figure, which is gonna be this one right over here. Hit enter, and then control R. Same thing over here for accrued, accrued salaries, equals, control down arrow, all the way till we reach this one. And then we're gonna multiply that by the revenue key, Let's make sure to lock this one, press the F4 key twice, so the dollar sign is only on the number, hit enter there, then we should be able to just drag that across, so go to Control R, and then Control D. Great, now that's looking more like it. So we've calculated the current assets and the current liabilities, meaning that we can finally get to the free cash flow. So let's go back to the free cash flow tab by pressing Control up arrow, all the way up over here. And so we're gonna plug the current assets. So that's that equals to control page down all the way here. And it's gonna be current assets for 2022. Hit enter there. Same thing for current liabilities equals control page down. And it's gonna be this figure right over here. Hit enter. Then we're just gonna drag these two across. So press the control R key. Great. Now for networking capital, this is gonna be current assets minus current liabilities. So it's equals to this one minus this other one right below it. Hit enter there and again, we'll drag that across, control R. And lastly, for the change in networking capital, press the F2 key there so you can see what it was like previously. And it's basically the current years minus the previous years. And we can just go ahead and copy that. So we'll go shift right arrow and then control R. That's gonna copy the same formula. To make sure, let's just press the F2 key there and you can see that it's one minus the other one in the same way. Great, now to find the unlevered free cash flow, we're gonna have to go to equals. It says the it's gonna start with this one here, and then we're gonna plus depreciation and amortization, as it says right over here. We're gonna minus capital expenditures, as that's an outflow. We're gonna minus the change in networking capital, and then hit enter there. From here, shift right arrow again, and control R. So we finally reached the free cash flow, 
and I haven't quite yet talked about what the company is or what it does. So let me know in the comments if you're able to guess out of all of these industry groups over here, what industry this company could be in based on its financial statements, especially look through their income statement, balance sheet and cash flow and try to guess that. Also look at the networking capital and all these ratios that we calculated. That should give you a few hints. Let me know in the comment below. All right, now moving on to the discounted cash flow tab. So go to control page down all the way to the DCF tab. And first things first, we're gonna have to plug the unlevered free cash flow up over here. So we'll go equals control page up all the way to the first one. And we'll select this first figure over here, hit enter, and we'll just drag that across by pressing the control R. And because these values from 2022 to 2026 are actually in the future, we're gonna need to discount them back using a discount rate. And that discount rate is going to be the WAC, which takes us to the step two in our DCF process. The WAC is short for the weighted average cost of capital, and it's basically the cost of financing for a company. Now this financing can come either in the form of debt through things like bonds, or in the form of equity through things like selling stock. Now both of these do come with a cost, so there's the cost of debt, and there's also the cost of equity that's associated with it. And this is the formula for the WAC. I know it looks a bit daunting, so let's go ahead and break it down. First off, you have the portion of equity, which stands for the E there. And then on the bottom, you have the total company value, which is the equity plus the debt. So here you're essentially getting the proportion. Then you're gonna multiply that by the return on equity, which is basically the cost of equity here. And similarly on the debt side, you've got the debt on top, followed by the debt plus equity on the bottom, times that by the cost of debt, and over here you have this 1 minus T, which is basically the 1 minus the tax rate. That's because interest payments are tax deductible, so that's why you leave that right over there. Now that we understand the formula, let's go ahead and apply it on Excel. So go to the WAC tab right next to the DCF tab over here. And up top we're going to have the equity proportion and we're also going to have the debt. So this is the total debt value and the total equity value of the company. If you want to see how we calculated the debt value, press the F2 key there. And this is basically from the balance sheet, it's a current portion of long-term debt, and then the long-term debt, it's the sum of those two. Then right below that, we're gonna have everything to do with the cost of debt. And then right over here, we're gonna have everything to do with the cost of equity. And finally, we'll be able to derive the WAC, the weighted average cost of capital. So first off, for the cost of debt, this is going to be equals to the interest expense. So go to control page down, all the way to the income statement. And what we're gonna wanna select here is this interest expense, which is going to be this last figure in 2021. Then we're going to divide that by control page up all the way to the walk, the debt here and hit enter. Now we want this to be a positive sign. So press the F2 key at the very front. We're just going to put a negative sign and that's going to make it positive for us. Then for the debt over debt plus equity, it's a simple this one over here divided by the sum of the debt plus the equity. So these two up over here and close those brackets and hit enter there. So the after-tax cost of debt for us, you can see we have a tax rate of 21%. If you hover over all of these with red red, um, red buttons, it's basically a, co a comment that you can see right there. So this is the US corporate tax rate, for instance. So for us, the after-tax cost of debt is gonna be equals to the cost of debt. And then we're gonna multiply that by, in brackets, one minus the tax rate, close those brackets and hit enter. That should give you 1.8%. Then we've got the cost of equity, and this one's a bit trickier. As you can see, it's got more line items. So to calculate the cost of equity, you actually need to use what's known as the CAPM, which stands for the Capital Asset Pricing Model. So let's look into the formula for that. The formula here is the risk-free rate, which is typically the 10-year US Treasury, which is seen as the safest investment out there. Then you're going to add the B, which stands for the beta. Now the beta it represents how volatile your stock is, relative to the markets. And the market has a beta of one, meaning that if you have a beta of say two, that means that when the market's up 10%, you're up 20%. Same thing goes when you're down, obviously. So it's just a lot more volatile. Then you've got the expected return of the market minus the risk-free rate. So let's look into this on the Excel file. So up top, we have all of the relevant information that you might need. We went ahead and got, gathered that from the internet. So for the market risk premium, it's basically press the F2 key there, it's basically the expected market return minus the risk-free rate. That's what's known as the market risk premium. And based on those, let's first calculate the proportions here. So equals the equity value divided by the sum, press the top key there, of the debt plus the equity. Close those brackets and hit enter. 
And then for the cost of equity, we gotta do the CalPEM formula we just mentioned earlier. So it's a risk-free rate, which as you can see, it's 3.1%, which is actually higher than it typically is, uh, mainly because of the current market conditions. Plus, we're gonna select the beta, which in this case is 0.7%. And we're gonna multiply that by, in brackets, the market risk premium, which is basically the expected market return minus the risk-free rate. Close those brackets and hit enter there. That should give you 6.4%. 6 From there, we can go ahead and start calculating the WAC. So the WAC formula is going to be equals to, we already have the after-tax cost of debt, so we'll go ahead and select that, multiply by the proportion of debt, which is this one, and then plus the other side, which is the cost of equity, multiplied by the proportion of equity, and hit enter there. As you can see, if you do the formula in several steps, it just looks a bit less daunting and easier to understand. So in our case, it's at 6.2%. So we'll go control page up and we'll just go ahead and plug the WAC, which is this line over here, equals control page down and we'll select the 6.2% uh, that we just calculated here. Now that we calculated the WAC, which is gonna stand as a discount rate, we can go ahead and calculate the present value of the free cash flows. So all of the present value of all of these cash flows that we calculated, which are for the estimated years. So we'll go equals, then we'll select the unlevered free cash flow, divide that by, in brackets, one plus, and here we're gonna need the discount rate, which is the WAC we mentioned. We'll press the F4 key once, which is basically going to lock it for us. Close those brackets, and we're gonna put that to the power of one in this case, because it's projection year of one there. Hit enter, and then we'll go shift, right arrow, and then control R. To make sure this is all right, let's go to the very last one, press the F2 key, and you can see that this is still locked on the same spot, and we've moved all the way to the fifth year, which makes sense. And speaking of valuing a company, if you're liking this video, you can also check out our course. We're an investment banker, a financial analyst, and myself teach everything we know about finance, valuation, and financial modeling on Excel. First, we cover financial statement analysis using Apple's real annual report as an example. Then we get into financial modeling through a three statement model. After that, we begin the valuation phase where you learn to do a discounted cash flow, a comparable company's valuation, and a present transactions valuation on Adobe, looking at the real financial statements to eventually derive a valuation range. Lastly, we'll show you how to present an investment thesis using a stock pitch format. So if you're interested in checking it out, go to the link in the description below. All right, back to the video. Moving on to step three, which is calculating the terminal value. And this is the value of the company beyond the forecasted period. So in this case, we forecasted for five years, but the company doesn't just go bankrupt or disintegrate after that. Instead, it probably has an ongoing life and so we wanna calculate how much that's going to be worth. There's a couple ways to calculate the terminal value, but in our case, we'll use the perpetuity growth method. And here's the formula for it. We've got the free cash flow in year N, which is the final year forecast, and you multiply that by one plus the growth rate, which is that G there. Now this growth rate is typically the GDP growth of a country or the industry growth of a particular company. And below that you have the WAC minus the G for the growth rate again. In our case, if we look at the Excel file, you can see we've got a growth rate of 3%. And so this is the industry standard growth rate that we went for. And right below, we have the terminal value over here, which we need to calculate. So let's go ahead and apply the formula. It's gonna be equals to the free cash flow on the final year forecast, so it's 2026 for us. Then let's, let's multiply that by the, in brackets, one plus the 3% over here. Close those brackets. And then we're gonna divide that by in brackets again, we're gonna have the WAC, so we can actually see it, but it's the uh, row 12 over here, minus the growth rate, which is the 3% again, close those brackets and hit enter. Currently, the terminal value is in the future, so this takes us to our fourth step, which is discounting both the terminal value and the free cash flow. So let's go about the terminal value first. So it's gonna be equals to the terminal value over here, and then we're gonna divide that by, in brackets, one plus the discount rate, which is gonna be the WAC for us. Close those brackets, and we're gonna put this to the power of the fifth one, which is where we're at, and then close the brackets there. And then for the present value of the free cash flows, we already have them discounted right up over here. So we just need to go to equals, sum, and we're gonna sum all of these. The reason we can go ahead and sum them is because they're already discounted. 
Nice. Now we get to the enterprise value, which is simply going to be equals to the present value of the terminal value plus the present value of the free cash flows and hit enter there. All right, now that we've reached the enterprise value, we're getting into the last step, which is calculating an implied share price. Now to do so, we first need to know the equity value. So let's look into that. To reach the equity value, you can see that we have these few uh, line items that we need to fill first, the cash, the debt, and the minority interest. Depending on which company, they might not have the minority interest. So firstly, for the cash, it's just gonna be equals to under the balance sheet. So go to control page down, cash and cash equivalents, and we're gonna select the most recent, hit enter there. Then for the debt, we're gonna go equals, and we actually already have this under the WAC, which is gonna be this figure right over here, hit enter. And lastly, for minority interest, we should find this one on the balance sheet. So control page down all the way to the balance sheet. And if we go towards the bottom, we should be able to find it. Let's see, under equity, non-controlling interest. So that's the same thing. We'll go over here, select the 514 there and hit enter there. So for the equity value, it's gonna be equals to the enterprise value plus the cash minus the debt minus the minority interest, hit enter there. And now to reach an implied share price, we're gonna have to use the shares outstanding over here. So it's gonna be one divided by the other. It's a total equity value divided by the number of shares that are out there in the market. That's gonna give us the implied share price of $358. Great, so we finally reached an implied share price, but in order to do so, we had to make a few different assumptions. If we look into the Excel file, you'll notice we made a big assumption here on the growth rate, and were I to change this to a 2%, then the share price does change quite dramatically. Press Ctrl Z to go back. The same thing would happen to the WAC. And so in order to combat this and try to see what it would feel like with a different type of growth rate, say, we will use this sensitivity table over here with the growth rate on one side and the WAC on the other and see how that varies depending on whether this goes up by say 0.5% or down. So to do so for the growth rate here, we're just gonna have to take the growth rate number here, Ctrl C, and we're gonna have to paste it as a value. It's important that we paste as a value. Go to Alt H V V for that. That's gonna paste as a value. Same thing goes for the WAC, Control C. We'll paste it over here as a value, Alt H V V. And also we're gonna have to link the share price. So we'll go equals and we'll link the implied share price over here, hit enter. And so we wanna go in increments of 0.5. So we'll go equals three plus 0.5%, hit enter there and control C, control V, same thing over here, equals three plus 0.5%, hit enter there. Sorry, this should be minus F2 there, minus 0.5% and same thing right over here. And on this side, it's the same concept. Let me fast forward that. Nice, now that we have this whole table laid out, let's go ahead and use one of Excel tools to be able to auto-populate this whole table. So first we'll select everything, control shift down, control shift right, from here, we'll go under data, what if analysis, and here we wanna go under data table. For the row input cell, we're gonna select this growth rate over here and then press the tab key. For the column input cell, we're gonna want the WAC. Select that one, hit okay there, and then this should auto-populate with all of the di different share prices depending on how the growth rate changes or how the WAC changes as well. Now I realize that this valuation was a bit simplified, but I hope you found it useful. To learn more about different valuation methods, go to this link over here to learn the comparable company's valuation, or this other link over here to learn more about finance and valuation. Hit that like and that subscribe if you liked it, and I'll catch you in the next one.